Good afternoon, good afternoon, and welcome to the Sunset Safari here on Saturday, the... Woo! Goodness gracious me, the 8th of December 2018. My name is James Henry, and it's wonderful to have all you kids with us on the Nat Geo Kids Show. Please ask your parents or guardians to send us any questions you might have to the email natgeokids at wildearth.tv. That's natgeokids at wildearth.tv. It should appear at the bottom of your screen now. Yes, good. Now, it is very, very likely that we are going to have a vicious storm sometime soon here in the Western Kruger Park. That's where we find ourselves in South Africa now. And there is a big storm brewing. You saw the lightning thrashing down onto a part of the world known as Bushbuck Ridge. That's where the storm's coming from at the moment still a little bit away from us so hopefully it will avoid us for the next little while while we are trying to take you on safari my plan this afternoon is to go and find an old male leopard called tingana and he was around eating a baby impala earlier today i'm not sure if he's still eating it hopefully he's just lying on a tree or on the ground very peacefully waiting for the rain to come it's been very very hot indeed it's been about 34 degrees it is about 34 degrees celsius now 93 Fahrenheit. Much cooler it is up in the Masai Mara where David Gatamba Getu has made his way onto the rolling plains of the Mara Triangle and he's looking forward to saying hello to you. Hello boys and girls of Nat Geo and welcome to our safari drive from a different country further north from South Africa in Kenya and we are in the Mara Triangle and I'm inviting you or we are starting the show here with zebras and I'm sure you're all excited to have seen zebras. My name is David and with me on camera is James. Hello James. And when James does that, is a sign of good luck. And what's the good luck today, James? James is telling me good luck like this means lions. So if you don't see lions, we are going to hold James accountable. I'm sure the other James down there must have told you something interesting or something important. That if you ask us questions, you're going to make us very happy. If you got any comments through your parents or guardians, send them through using nudgeyourkids at wildearth.tv. Now, we've got zebras to start with, and these zebras don't seem to be moving a lot because I think it's a bit cold for them. It's about 20 degrees Celsius and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a bit cold for us. I'm sure maybe to you that could be a bit warm. And that's why these zebras seem a bit slow as they feed. But if you're going to warm up, they'll move a little bit more. Now, before we continue, I want you to know that all the stripes you see with those zebras there, the black and white, or the white and black, each zebra has a different pattern from the other. Can you believe that? Every one zebra will not be similar to the other, even those two that you see there. In our normal homes, I want to give you an example of an animal that is closely related to the zebras, and it is a horse. So if you look at this zebra carefully, you can see the tail look like of a horse. On top of its neck, it got a mane. So they are closely related to horses. But also they happen to eat the same food. They eat grass. So zebras, like the one you see there, and the horses eat grass. And we call them vegetarians. And a better word to use, you can say they are herbivores. And you can see how he's just cutting the grass there and making sure she's only getting the green grass, which is more nutritious. She's avoiding the tall that you see there that's a bit brown because it doesn't have any vitamins or nutrients in it. So they tend to concentrate on the short one. And as James was saying, they're expecting a storm. Here, we have started to see what we call the short trains. And when the short trains come, we get fresh shoot of grass coming from the ground. And all this area will be green in the next few days and zebras and other animals will love it. Rosalie, that's a good question and you would like to know how much zebras weigh. The fully grown ones, say the males, could be about almost 300 kilograms, say put about 600 pounds. And the females could be slightly less than that, could be maybe 500, 550 pounds. 
In general, all the animals here in the African wilderness, Rosaline, the males tend to weigh a little bit more than the females, be they elephants, be they lions, be they giraffes. In general, males weigh a bit more than females. You can see now they're just eating grass and when zebras move, they'll always move in groups and those groups of zebras, we call them herds, herds of zebras. A simple group of zebras would be like the father, the mother, or what you call the male, and the female, and the female be like not one, but maybe two or three females in the group, and a few young ones, or a few boys and girls, just like you. So you'll see one male, which is a zebra, and then the female, which will be the mother, and a few young ones. Now, I won't tell you my plans today. My plans today, James was talking, I'm going to look for a leopard for you. My plans today is what James, the one I have with me today, is to go and look for some, for some lions. So if James in South Africa will be looking for a leopard for you, I'm thinking of hopefully to get some lions for you. And I better start moving so that we get some lions as soon as we can. I want to show you a bit of clouds because I was talking about the short trains and James is going to show you a bit of clouds to our right and see how it looks like in Africa before we get the rains. So just watch to your right and see how it looks. There's a huge escarpment there and on top of that escarpment you can see the clouds that are building up there. There's an indication we might have some showers later. And casting the final control says it's beautiful. We don't have a single drop of rain now, but you never know how it will come out or how it will play later in the day. But just look at that beautiful escarpment to the clouds. And I'm sure you might have noticed the difference in vegetation between me or who I am and who I James is. The vegetation here in the Mara Triangle, it's more open. It's more what you call grassland, which is called savanna. And you'll be seeing some scattered trees here and there. One tree here, one tree there, a bush here, a bush there. And it's very open. Not very heavy or thick vegetation like it is in Juma. All righty. It's time to go and look for different animals. But my main aim today is to get you some lion somewhere. Sorry, get me the custom for Alex again, Castri. Very good, Alex. That's a very good question. And you'd like to know what do zebras use or how do they defend themselves because they do not have horns. It's a very good question. And what zebras will do, they do two things. Number one, they might use their teeth to bite each other if they are just fighting among us themselves. But if it's defending themselves from, say, lions, they kick very hard and they kick using their back legs. So Alex, to defend themselves, they use their back legs to kick wherever. You have seen horses using their back legs that's exactly what the zebras also do. It's a bit windy here, but sometimes when it gets very windy like this, it's always a sign of maybe some rains coming later on. But as it is, as I said, we do not have a single droop. Very good, boys and girls, thank you for your question. Keep bringing more questions. Should you have any comments, keep bringing them on. But apart from James and myself, there is another girl in South Africa who would like to say hello to all of you.
Yes, hello boys and girls. Good afternoon. My name is Lauren and I am all the way from Scotland. And in South Africa right now, we have an, a little bit of bad weather here. It's almost a bit like Scotland, to be honest, except we've got lots of lightning in the sky. We will try and see if we can show you some lightning at some point. So it's getting a little bit chilly, but I am hoping to show you some spotty cat possibly a leopard. That is what we are on the lookout for today. So I hope we can find that for you if the weather holds up. Hopefully we won't get rained on too much, but we do have our rain covers on the car. So we won't get too wet if the rain does come. So there's nothing out that we have seen at the minute, but that could also be because of the weather. The animals will be feeling that too, remember? So some may be hiding and some may be trying to keep warm somewhere. So let's see what we can find. And don't forget to send in any questions. We'll be more than happy to answer them for you. Did you hear that? That was the thunder. So we will try and see if we can get some lightning for you later. But now we're gonna leave South Africa and head all the way over to the Mara to see what David has for you. Well, boys and girls of Nat Geo, do not worry because right here in Kenya, it is still stable. The weather is very good, unlike in South Africa with all the thunders and the lightning that you saw there. And luckily, we got some new animals for you, apart from the zebras that we saw before, we got antelopes. So these antelopes, I want you to know, they are the largest antelopes in the whole world. And we call them elands. Elands? This is the largest antelopes in the whole world. They are huge, they are big, they are heavy. But should they see, oops, that one is having a toilet break. Can you see that? So that one tells you she is a girl. She is having a wee there. Now, the girls tend to be brownish in color, and the boys tend to be grayish in color. And I had a question, I guess, from Alex who was asking me how do zebras defend themselves because they have no horns. Now, elands, you can tell how they defend themselves because they got horns and they will defend themselves against any animal, be it a lion or a cheetah or a leopard, using their horns. And those horns are sharp and they're very long. Both males and females, and when I'm talking about males and females, I'm talking about boys and girls. For the elands, they got horns on them. Unlike certain antelopes, where females or the girls will not have any horns. And just like the zebras, these elands here are also herbivores and they eat grass. You can see the amount of zebras we have here, so many. And uh, we have also found something different for you boys and girls. And that is a bird, and that bird is called the secretary bird. You see, it just scared that zebra away, eh? That baby zebra saw the bird and was like, you look very different from us, who are you? But see the difference of the baby zebra and adult zebra. The adult zebras don't look very worried. Now, what this bird is doing, she's looking on the ground, you see, she stopped, and she's looking for food. And when animals like birds like this are looking for food, we say they're looking for prey. And yeah, casting the final control says a beautiful bird. And what these birds eat, they eat small animals. And when I'm talking animals, they also eat snakes. So they could be eating reptiles. Reptiles are animals like lizards or skins. Of course, snakes are also types of reptiles and also they catch insects for themselves. For example, grasshoppers, or they might catch for themselves locusts or even beetles. Just see how majestic she walks. Ding, ding. It's like she is wearing high-heeled shoes, eh? Ding. And look at the beautiful feathers that she got at the back of her head. And such beautiful eyes, like they have a makeup. 
and keeps going and I'm sure it will be getting itself some food very quickly and as I said food for the animals that look for food like birds or other animals we say they're looking for prey now right here where I am not very far from where I am I got my other friend who'd show you something different from the bird Indeed, we are not very far from where David is, but we've got the cutest little baby elephant that is only probably a few weeks old. It is very, very small. You can see it's walking around with the rest of the herd as they slowly graze their way along through the grassland, but it is the cutest, cutest little baby ever. And you can see mom is a beautiful specimen. She's massive with big tusks. She's a big girl, that, and she'll be able to look after that little baby. Now, what you can see is that it's busy dropping off down into the valley below, and these guys are heading up on what we call an escarpment which is the edge of a, a sort of mountain and they're heading there because they're going towards the forest where there's lots and lots of food for them so that's where they're heading at the moment and that little one is going to have to walk a little bit and go up a very 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 big hill in order to be able to get food now I haven't even said hello my name is Tristan and on camera I've got Archie this afternoon and it's wonderful to have all of you with us up here in East Africa and it really is a beautiful afternoon even though it's a little bit cold and a little bit windy and lots of clouds it's still a nice afternoon to be out and the animals should be quite active because of the cooler weather we should see some of the cats being out a little bit more obviously the Ellie's won't mind walking right out in the open because the Sun is not too hot now so they can move around and they can spend time in this open area where we can get a really nice view of them now typically in the Mara what you'll find is that at night the Ellie's they like to be in the forested areas and up on the slope of this escarpment and then in the day they come down and they start to feed on all these beautiful grasses that we've got here there's also areas down below where there's water and so that's where they'll go and they'll drink and they'll get mud on them and, and cool themselves down feed on the grass and then they go up to the slopes so, Nico, Nico, will, will the baby struggle to keep up with the rest of the herd? No, not really. Um, you'll find what will happen is if the baby gets very tired, it will just lie down somewhere and the rest of the herd will stop. So, Ellie's are very, very, very good at looking after their babies. And if their little ones get a little tired, then the little one will lie down and the rest of the herd will just sit around. But it has to learn how to walk. It has to learn how to be able to strengthen its muscles. And so every day they'll go a little bit further, a little bit further until that one is used to it. And then they can walk up and down no problem. But you will find it does get tired from time to time and then it will try and find a little place where it can go and lie down and rest. But isn't it cute? I think it's a very cute little one. It's kind of sitting now between one of its siblings and you can see it's putting its trunk in one of its siblings mouth now that is a way that elephants greet each other so it's like when people shake hands it's the same for the Ellie's as they were able to then smell one another and they work out who it is and it's a bonding process that takes place and it's very important that this little Ellie does these kind of things you can see it's also <laughs> trying to grab some of the food out of its mom's mouth so its trunk doesn't work very well just yet it's still learning all of this kind of thing and so as mom is eating it's almost trying to grab some of that food and put it in its own mouth but how cute is that very very cool now the little one is still drinking milk it's still going to make sure that it kind of goes up and suckles you can actually kind of see that when it tries to use its trunk it doesn't work very well and that's because Ellie babies they have to wait until they're around sort of two years old before they have complete control of their trunk to feed correctly and be able to find enough food by themselves Kathy, coming down the hill? No, I haven't seen an Ellie fall coming down this hill. I've seen Ellie's fall on other hills, um, but this particular one, no. Um, the Ellie's come down quite slowly and quite gently, um, and, and you'll find that they almost come down at sort of a side-on angle so that they don't end up toppling over. But I have seen in places where they go down smaller banks, especially if it's very wet and muddy, then you'll find that they can slip and fall down, particularly the little babies. They lose their footing quite quickly, and then they fall, and they can tumble down. But what happens is, is if a little baby falls it's quite amazing to watch the herd becomes incredibly protective and they'll all rush there and they'll try and help that little baby so they'll use their trunks to try and stop the baby from falling or to try and pick it back up again it really is quite amazing to watch Ellie's when they do these kind of things they are very very good at looking after their babies and making sure their little ones are well protected and don't fall down hills that much but I'm sure it has happened I'm, I'm pretty sure there has been a few Ellie's that have slipped and kind of fell, fallen a little bit luckily though the slope that is on that sort of escarpment area it looks a lot steeper than it actually is so for an elephant that's not too bad it's fairly gentle
gentle as it goes up. There are obviously certain places where they won't go because it's too steep, but for the most part, they will be able to just kind of move slowly up. And it's actually amazing to see the sort of scale of that escarpment. You know, the Ellies, when they were close by, they look so big. And now when you see them up against that mountain, you realize just how big that kind of ridge is that they have to climb. And they will climb all the way to the top. And they'll go right to the top of that area tonight, and they'll end up feeding up there. And then in the morning, they do the opposite, and they come all the way back down again. And we often find them at about sunrise, starting to come down the hill. And then by the time the sun is up there on these grassy plains once again, but absolutely beautiful. It's one of the things about the Mara is that it's one of the most beautiful places. And when people think of Africa, this is the kind of places that they think of. They think of these big open grasslands and rolling kind of hills where the animals can walk around. So we're very spoiled to be able to be in a place like this. Now, our Ellies are going to drift off. They're going to go down into a little dip shortly, which is not going to mean that we probably won't see too much more of them as they go kind of head down. I want to just try and check a little water point that's not far from us. It's a few hundred meters kind of over there. So somewhere there is a water point. Um, we're going to try and head towards this sort of water point and see if there's anything happening there. Now, while I head on my way there, we do have, well, I suppose an announcement is probably a good thing. Um, so, in South Africa at the moment, we have what is called load shedding. Now, load shedding is because there is a few issues with our power supply across the country, and so the national power supplier is going, is cuts off certain sections, and they've cut off Juma for the afternoon, which means that we are running on UPSs and those kind of things. And now, unfortunately, the amount of time that has been going has been very long that our UPSs are going to die, and probably die within the next 50, or 10 to 15 minutes. And if that happens, unfortunately, we might go off air. So I'm just warning everybody that if we do suddenly just stop coming to you, it is because that is the problem. We have lost power completely, and if we don't have power, we unfortunately cannot come to all of you guys. Hopefully though it will be sorted out and hopefully the power will come back on soon. Oh, hello little jackals. So here's some carnivores, which are always, well, I suppose omnivores is actually a better word for these guys. They're not carnivores. These guys will eat some fruits at some times of the year, but most of what they're eating is going to be meat and it's a pair together. You'll find this is what you'll see mostly with jackals unless they've got young ones with them mostly a pair mom and a dad together and they will rummage around for all kinds of little food items so they're going to be looking for things like little mice and um, even little beetles and bugs and grubs um, and then they'll also scavenge so they'll find a big carcass let's say lions brought down a buffalo or a wildebeest or a zebra and there was some left then these little guys will come in and they'll eat the last little bits they'll start to kind of clean up and make sure that everything is sorted out and that there's not too much left to waste so they're one of the smaller sort of scavengers that we get out here they have a tough time in this particular part of the world because of lots of hyenas which bully them a little bit at the kills and so it's a bit tricky for them to actually be able to find the food that they kind of need from scavenging so they have to do a lot of hunting of their own and they're pretty good hunters actually they do a very good job now I'm going to just try and reverse a little bit so we can keep seeing them I like jackals I think they're very very cool animals they're very clever as well so we're just gonna go back a little bit just gonna try and see I can get one more view for you guys before they disappear. Now reversing is always one of those skills that you'll learn as a safari guide. As you kind of drive around you have to do a lot of reversing and learning how to drive backwards which is a skill in itself and particularly when you don't have mirrors on your side to be able to see behind you one has to learn very quickly to kind of stick your neck out on the other side of the road to be able to actually see but there we go now jackals are just on our side now so you can see they're coming up the hill and slowly kind of moving along i'm pretty sure they're going to go and find some sort of food items these guys are active more at night than anything else um well sunset sunrise and then at night that's how kind of you'll see them at their most sort of peak activity so now they're just getting going they've just woken up it's sort of sunrise if you want to call it for them their day is just starting and isn't that cool very very sweet little things all right well they're disappearing over the ridge so we'll carry on downwards towards where our little water point is hopefully it will be a successful visit to our water point there is often a pride of lions that spends time there so maybe we'll get lucky and they'll be lying about Right, now while I do that though, I'm going to send you back across to David, who's further down in the vast plains ahead of me, and I wonder what he's up to right now. 
Very good, boys and girls. I told you things are going to get better and better, having now seen baby elephant from my baby baby zebra and from my secretary bird. I'm not sure I can see some other big birds here. And James is going to show you in a few seconds. And I think I'm doing more of birding than anything else. But don't forget, I still promised to you some lions at one point. But before we do that, why don't we enjoy seeing these huge birds that we call hornbills. We call the hornbills because if you look at their beaks, their beaks look like a horn. See that? And now, as much as you see these birds walking on the ground, they do fly. And we call them ground hornbills. We call them ground hornbills because they spend most of their time on the ground looking for food. And they could be looking for any insects. What I want to do, I want to drive a little bit in front so that you can see. Because I saw four of them. That was the last one that we saw. And see whether you can see all the other three or the four of them together. And there they are. And I think one of them is trying to eat something. It just swallowed something. And that's a very cool bird, you're right, Casty. And see what they do. They dig on the ground. Is that one there? Either she's digging to get something. She got something and just swallowed. Or there's something she has brought down and she's just feeding on it. Hello there. That's bright red wattle like the other one that we saw because it's young. As they get older, you see that one there? The wattle below the neck and by the eyes, it's very bright red. That means he is or she's a bit old. When they are young, it's not as bright uh, red. So they could either be catching small insects or, you know, for example, beetles. That's what they feed on. But also, they eat small reptiles like, uh, I would say, oops, you see this one's having a little go for each other, like tortoises. And once they kill the tortoises, their beaks are so strong that they can open a shell of a tortoise and feed on the flesh. If you look at the male, it's bright red there, and the female will have a bit of blue on that water. So spending a lot of time on the ground. See those two, as they're feeding each other, see what they're doing there? And they were sharing some meal, I would guess. You see how they trying to crush it just to make sure it doesn't get stuck in their throat. So that one could be the male and the other one is the female there. Sorry, what did Shalom ask? Sharon, good question. You'd like to hear the call for these birds? Just stay there. I want to play it to you as you keep watching it and you'll hear the calls they make. They're very quite loud and I'll be getting it to you in a few seconds. And that's a very good question that I've really loved as you keep watching it there. So there's going to be Hornbill and it's going to be Southern Hornbill and keep watching it but you're going to listen to the call of it. Did you hear that? Did it sound good? I'm going to play it one more time because I also enjoyed it. I haven't had it for a long time. Okay, we're going to play it one more time. Shall we just stay there and listen? Excellent. I hope you enjoyed it. And that's very unique in them. So I want to show you a close-up picture on my iPod here. And James is going to come to me and show the difference between the males and the female. Now, it's going to be very, very clear. But on top there is the female I was talking about. But if you look on the red there, if I remove my hand. Thank you, James. She got a bit of blue at the very base of the beak 
that's the female, but the male is all red. So there's no blue on the male. And in general, when you look at most birds in Africa, the males tend to be more brightly colored than the females. So that's a general rule, just like ostriches, all birds, the males tend to be more bright. So if you look on this red water here, and this red here on the female, the one for the male is more conspicuous or is bright red than the one of the female because the one of the female has a bit of blue in it. So that's what you call the southern ground hornbill. All right, it's time to move and see whether I can keep my promise as what I had promised before. And hopefully you're gonna get some lions. But what happens, every time you plan to do something or you're going somewhere, you will bump into birds, you'll bump into other different animals. So it's always exciting just to stop and look. So we have one of them walking in front of us. And if you look at her carefully, she looks smallish and doesn't have the red bread. MGN, you'd like to know how much territory they cover every day. I do not have an idea of how much territory they would cover, but I know they move a lot. Luckily, they have a very good choice for food, and it's very difficult to document birds like in what, you know, how much territory they can cover in a day. Unlike, say, animals like, you know, cheetahs or lions that are territorial. So these birds are not territorial and they move a lot. And I do not think there have been people or, you know, researchers who have followed them very closely to have an idea how much, you know, ground they would be able to cover in a day. But should I be able to know? I will definitely let you know. But you can see they move a lot looking for food. And once it gets dark, they'll always go on top of trees and spend the night. And they normally make their homes or nests inside huge trees that have cavities. And they'll use the hole or the crevice of a tree to lay their eggs and raise their chicks. So ideally spending the better part of the day on the ground looking for anything they can catch, any insects. As I said, they got very strong beaks. That's a very good question. You're asking about the northern ground hornbill. As I said, this is the southern. We do not have the southern, uh, the northern ground hornbill, but we have another hornbill that's called Abyssinian ground hornbill. Abyssinian ground hornbill that, if you look at it, it have a, like a small little crest on top of its beak, unlike the southern ground, uh, southern ground hornbill. And that's a very good question. And let me see if I can get it again on my pad and show you what I'm saying. And the males, and the females of the Abyssinian ground hornbill are very different from each other, unlike the southern ground hornbill. So I'll show you the female, the blue you saw below the beak, or at the base of the beak on the southern ground hornbill. When you look at the Abyssinian ground hornbill, it's all blue and they do not have any red on them. It's only the male that have a bit of red, but apparently the male also have a bit of blue. Now, like that one, if you look carefully, I guess that's all male. And if it should be a female, there'll be a bit of blue on that swollen part of that. So let me show you now how the Abyssinian ground hornbill look. On my little part, it's having a bit of scratch there. Sorry, James, I'm sure you can come here and we show the beautiful kids what I'm talking about. Thank you very much. And that is the Abyssinian ground hornbill. And as I said, if you look at the one on the right, that's a female. It's all blue. And if you look at the male, it has a bit of blue in it and a bit of red. Whereas when you looked at the southern ground hornbill, the female is the one that had a bit of blue and red, and the male did not have any blue. All right, you see, now this one still have a bit of red and blue, making it a bit colorful. But the female, as I said earlier, the males in general are always a bit colorful than the females. All right, time to move on and see whether we could be lucky to get for you a kitty cat somewhere. I'm trying to smell and James is telling me... Nikoniko Injo after following ground horn before a long time. 
I'll always see them busy and foraging. I don't remember this ground field feeding at night. And then one time, of them because of coming very endangered because they are losing, I'll say they're losing habitat. Nico Nico, there's a lot of logging going on in Africa, unfortunately, because people were cutting trees either for construction or for furniture or for wood fuel. And that is making them, you know, lose their nesting ground. And I have personally gotten some interest to follow them sometimes a whole afternoon going to early evening. Once it is start getting dark, you'll see them getting towards the trees and you know, they tend to get some tall, uh, solid trees or forests and they always go on top of trees. I haven't seen any one of them feeding during the night. I've never found or how you'd end up seeing certain birds, you know, on the road or in an open area like this feeding. Not one nickel nickel of a ground hornbill I've ever seen. So I would say they're more or less diurnal birds than being nocturnal. Right, I'm seeing a small little herd of elephants ahead of me. And they have a small baby, like what Tristan had. And before I get to them, I first take you back to my friend Tristan, who is driving around. Well, David, while well, you go towards elephants, we too are heading towards more elephants and a big herd of buffalo. So we're just going to have to round a little corner here, then we'll be with one herd of Ellie's and there's a couple others that are scattered about and then the herd of buffalo behind that hopefully we'll be able to get a little bit closer to. So it's the idea anyway. We're going to have to just take this road to the left and pass this car quickly. Go. Now if we go down here we should get a nice view of these Ellie's which will be good. It's one nice thing about being out in the Mara as there's lots and lots of elephants and I love spending time with Ellie's and so I have a wonderful time here because there's lots and lots of them to sit and just watch and see how they do things. I, I think Ellie's are the most fascinating animals. They're incredibly intelligent and they spend a lot of time together and these family groupings are always so beautiful to watch and so I'm pretty sure we should get something quite nice out of these guys. They're quite close to the road. Sometimes they can be very very far away and that makes it a little bit tricky but these guys are nice and close and so we should get a good view of them as they feed their way along now if we just park somewhere like that that will help Archie a little bit but there we go now there's one elephant here on the right hand side that looks like it's got a bit of a funny ear so sometimes with Ellie's they do get damage to their ears if they get a bit of a cartilage break then their ear sometimes flaps a little bit funny and you can see the one on the right sort of right hand side that ear seems to be okay it's the one on the other side of its body that has got a bit of a kind of maybe it's just the way it's holding it it's a funny way that it's got its ears out normally Ellie's don't have their ears there you see that little kind of crease in their ear see it just sort of flaps forward more than what the other one does so sometimes you like I say you get a bit of damage there and then their ears does sort of fold forward now of course that won't really affect the Ellie too much other than that it probably will get a bit warmer than what other elephants do and the reason for that is if that ear flaps forward too much then the veins on the back side of the ear are exposed now with Ellie's the back sides of their ears are covered in a rich network of veins that is covered by a very thin layer of skin and that thin layer of skin is basically how they cool their blood down so as they flap their ear the blood in that in those veins air goes over them and it cools down now if it's folded forward then it means that the Sun is hitting those veins and effectively actually heating the blood a little bit so it'll have to do a lot more flapping and a lot more work to try and actually get its ear sorted out and to get its blood kind of flowing through quicker and, and and not then get too hot and then cool it down enough so it's an interesting kind of thing you see it's fairly regularly. I've seen quite a few Ellie's with it. So 
Miss Muffin, does a baby Ellie ever charge at our vehicle while we're in the Mara? I've had one or two be a little bit naughty. The baby Ellie's often are like that. They are quite playful animals, and when there's a, you know, a big object that they don't know and, and all the sort of adults are around them, then they can often be a little bit cheeky, and then they'll come kind of charging down the road. But it doesn't happen as much as you see in South Africa for some reason. I think it's maybe it's just because there's so much more space here that there's an easy way around. You know, it's not like they have to go through a bush or a tree. Um, and you'll find that <clears throat> a lot of the time we don't park as close to the Ellie's as you do in South Africa because you can see so nicely you have a much bigger distance and so the Ellie's you can see like this are not perturbed by us at any way whatsoever so they're not worried about our presence and therefore they just carry on doing their thing rather than actually interacting with us in any way but isn't it cute another little one that one's a lot older than the one we saw earlier and this one is probably already, I would say, about two years old, maybe even approaching three. So it's far more developed than what we saw a little bit earlier when we were watching that tiny little one walking around. It's already learned how to use its trunk. And you can see what it's doing is as it goes, it finds little food items and it wraps its trunk around. And its feet will help to break things off and kind of put it in the mouth. So pachyderm, no. Um, an elephant won't die if its ear is badly damaged because the other ear will just work harder. Um, if both ears were cut off completely, well, it would probably die because it would have blood loss. But if it didn't, let's say hypothetically it just had a deformity where it didn't have ears, I would imagine it would be a big problem. They would have to spend a lot more time in and around water, mud wallowing. They wouldn't be able to be out of water for very long periods because their body would just overheat too much and it would be very tricky for them. They would have to stay in shade and not come out into the sun. But I've never, to be honest with you, never seen an elephant with both ears missing. I've seen Ellie's with one ear very badly damaged where there's only a tiny little piece left. Um, that's maybe caught in a snare or something like that um, but I've never seen both ears missing and so you know I think if both were to to be lost and and it healed I think they would have a very big problem the thing is with an Ellie is those even if it loses half of its ear there's still a network there of veins that it can still utilize and so even though they won't won't be as efficient it still has a possibility of actually working and, and trying to get it right so they'll kind of work just a little bit harder to try and keep their blood flow circulating and and cool rather than you know just kind of dying and and, and you know giving up so they will do as much as they can and there you can actually see the veins that we're talking about those big sort of long stripes that go into the the ear and then spread out very very quickly and so that's how it controls its temperature but they'll be absolutely loving the weather that we've got this afternoon you see that their ears are not really flapping very much every now and then the ear is just pushing out slightly there's a little bit of a breeze that's blowing and when they push the ear out like that the breeze is actually doing the work and because the temperature is not very high they actually don't need to stress nearly as much about having to kind of manually cool their body by flapping their ears so they having a nice afternoon it's the perfect kind of conditions for Ellie's. it's also just rained in this particular section where we are right now and so there's a few little puddles there'll be some a bit of greenery that's coming through the grass is a lot greener here than in other parts and so it's the perfect place for these guys to go and feed and actually to find decent amounts of food shame that little one is trying to suckle while mom is walking now that is quite an old ellie to be suckling generally ellie's start to be weaned at about four years old um, which is when you just start to see their tusks and this one's got fairly big tusks already so it should be coming off milk soon I don't think that female will be producing huge amounts and also that Ellie's getting too big to even fit under there you see it's trying to get its kind of face in between the legs to suckle but its kind of head is getting too big and its tusks too long to actually be able to do so So, Pug, what is the white stuff in the eyes? It looks like just a bit of a secretion. Probably fine with the amount of dust that's around in the Mara at the moment. They, they getting a bit of a secretion from the eye itself and as they're kind of closing so it's coming out it's much like when you fall asleep and you wake up in the morning you get that sort of sleep that's there it would be a very similar concept it's just to lubricate the eye make sure that it's nice and clean and, and to kind of keep dust out of it they do have very long eyelashes which which helps in doing that but when it's conditions like it is at the moment where it is really very dusty if you go down to areas where it hasn't rained um, so a little bit further south where it didn't rain at all during the course of the day today there if you drive you get kind of covered in dust the whole car has got a thick layer and so that's just a little bit of a secretion just to help keep the eye nice and lubricated and and and, and clean you know if you get something in your eye your eye often starts to water and it starts to feel like there's liquid coming out and that's all just your eye trying to adjust and trying to kind of clean up 
I'm just having a little look. I can see lots and lots of cars quite far away, so I wonder what's down there. Maybe there's something of interest for us to go and have a little look at. I see quite a few, and, and in this area, there's actually a very good chance of seeing a black rhino. So maybe we'll go and have a little look down there. Archie's kind of showing you where they are. They're down on that big plane, so we're going to head in that direction, and maybe we'll get lucky and we'll find something very nice. There's also, say, the are not too far away, and that's general direction as well, so we might as well head there and see if we get lucky with something. I think we might. I think there might be something of interest in this general area. Right. <laughs> Just an situation. Apparently, our UPS is fully soldiering and so to be able to keep us live, which means that we're going on for longer. We're going to die. So I don't think so too much, but trying very bit to leave you McCrew also off everything, keep everything going a little bit better. It's obviously a, a tricky thing to do. But the Juma itself, so the James and Lauren, all the because apparently the lighting is so bad, just try and just try to not be to it, which is to do. It's not out in life, you know, the theory of I'm not sure I'd ever want to test it. Right. Well, we are apparently starting to get a few grants of our own, so we're going to send you across to David before they encrypt the Sorry boys and girls, because there Tristan's having a bit of a technical hitches. These are things that will happen every other day, but uh, on a brighter side, I told you I'd be doing lots of budding today. We saw the secretary bad, and we saw the ground uh, south on bill, and now I got something also about you to add because these are the birds that we call scavengers or we call them our garbage collectors. What am I talking about? Anytime they see a dead animal here out in the bush and for example either the lions have gotten it or some other cat, be it a leopard or a cheetah, whatever is left behind after the lions or the predators have gone, these birds will always come and clean all that mess. And I'm sure maybe back home, like every Saturday or every Saturday day of the week, you'll have maybe some people or a truck that will come and collect trash or garbage from your home. We call these our garbage or trash collectors here in the bush or in the savannah or in the wilderness. So they will clean anything that's left behind. My guess is they are definitely waiting for something. And I'm thinking maybe there could have been some lions or some cheetah or some leopard that could have brought maybe a zebra down or a wildebeest and they're waiting for it to move. Then they can go down and clean the mess that's left behind. We've got different types of vultures in Africa and most of the ones you see here are called the African white-backed vultures and the other type are called the rupers griffin vultures. So in Kenya we got about seven different types of vultures and this particular type they always go in big groups that we call flocks and they could be like five sometimes even to a hundred together. Can you believe it? Now because the lions are stronger than them or the cheetah or the leopard that could be somewhere eating they have to stay there and wait until this animal leaves. Because if they try to do that, it will quickly go to defend its food and push them back. So the only thing they have to do is just to sit there and wait. And if you look carefully, most of them got their heads or necks tucked in their bodies because it's a bit cold where we are. And just like human beings, also animals feel cold. Remember, boys and girls, we request you when we begin. If you have any questions or comments, please, through your parents or guardians, send them on email. Not your kids at World Earth. We are always very happy.